Right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope you're having a good OCP Summit 2018 so far. Hopefully that won't change now. I'm speaking to you. So I uh, hope it continues. So I'm going to talk to you today about the optimization of the open rack through a DFMA lens to help scale rollout. Now you may be thinking, well, you know, what am I talking about? Well, hopefully that become clear as I go through my slide and presentation here. Uh, my name is Derek Paul Windsor. I'm a design engineer and I work for Rital based in the UK in Plymouth. We have global uh, responsibility for um, the OCP rack and development along with Facebook. Um, we've been with them for, for many, many years. And uh, we manufacture out of the Plymouth plant and we're rolling out into uh, our American plant soon as well. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, a brief overview on the history of the open rack, where we started and where we are now, the challenges we faced in the early days of production, and a little bit about what is designed for manufacture, what's that mean, some examples of the optimization we've carried out, and the outcomes, so what has that enabled us to achieve. So looking at the time frame of the history of the open rack. So we've got there starting uh, from 2000, end of 2011, 2012, the uh, creation of, of the V1 open rack spec, which is finalized in 2013. Uh, we worked along that uh, very closely with Facebook to help define that. And then on to uh, 2014, uh, V1.2 was started. And that went through into 2015 when it was uh, finally released to the, uh, to the market. This is all based on the 12 volt architecture. And then in mid 2016, we made, moved to the V2 spec, which meant uh, 48 volt DC came along, and was integrated into the open compute specification on V2. Uh, we were one of the lead developers on, on that V2 48 volt DC rack. We submitted first uh, eight concepts, proof of concepts for DV testing in mid-2017, and they went through success, successful DV testing and um, sort of ready for deployment, really. And along that time as well, mid-2017, we started on the 12-volt uh, ORI project, which is Open Rack Improvement, some changes and some improvements there, just to help keep the product moving along. And in fact, where we are now, 2018, that ORI project is just being launched with the first uh, cabinets being manufactured this week from our factory in Plymouth, UK. So the challenges faced in the early days of manufacturing uh, an OCP rack. So looking at the critical dimensions we need to, um, to adhere to, the main one I'm going to focus on here is the, the depth dimension for the equipment between the equipment interfaces, how the equipment interfaces into the rack structure, which is the 789.6 dimension between the, the uh, snap-in location feature at the front and the uh, stops at the back of the rack. Um, I have talked um, last year in September at the uh, workshop in Dallas regarding the um, dimension between the front equipment latching position to the buzz bar position uh, in this similar kind of vein as this uh, and uh, proposed, proposed a uh, specification on an interface for the buzz bars to the rack to keep a commonality and to achieve that dimension but uh, today I'm talking about the equipment dimension for the equipment fitment. So the problems you know with repeatability so trying to hold a process to uh, CPK value of 1.33 or, or higher. Uh, it was always a challenge in the early days. Uh, assembly proved difficult, a lot of manual adjustments, parts moving around, lots of jigs and fixtures to hold things in place. Uh, it can affect the outcome. And what that means, it can affect the yield. First pass yield rates is not as good as they should be for production process in the early days. So you're getting fallout and, and waste in the process. So they need to, put, need to put other processes in place to make sure you capture that waste and then the waste doesn't get out to the, to the customer. Um, so of course, a lot more cost and a lot of processes involved in that. 
So I mentioned there a CPK value of 1.33 or, or greater. So that's, that's a sort of industry standard for um, running out a, a production system. Your CPK needs to be a minimum of 1.33. Anything lower than that, you're going to get uh, unacceptable rejects, which are going to cost you know, value and waste in the process. So the CP value, we're going to show what's capable. So you get a good bell curve. Uh, no dropouts, higher and lower. The graph on the left here is showing you, just to explain what CP and CPK is. I won't explain uh, too much on this because there's probably some Six Sigma experts in the room and uh, we know a lot more on it than I do. So, But the graph on the left shows a CP value of 0.66. So this is less than 1.33. And you see on the limits here, the red lines are the upper and lower limits of the specification, the 789.6 plus or minus 1. And we are getting uh, some fallout on the lower limit and some fallout on the upper limit. So it's centrally distributed. So the CP, the capable process, uh, it equals the CPK. So it's centered around the nominal, but you are getting dropout higher and lower out of the spec. So that means there, there's a figure there of, uh, of 45,500 um, you know, de de defective parts per million, which equates to about 5%. So that's not an acceptable level you know, for production. Which you move to the graph on the right, which is based around a CPK value of 1.33, you notice there's now, it's not so much a just dropout. It does look like they're on the scale that the, the limits have moved out. That's just a scale issue. It's not, they haven't, I'm sure you. And the limits still remain the same, 789.6 plus or minus one. It's just that now all of your data and your capable process is within your limits. And the fact that defective parts per million there, you can see, has come down to you know, 62.3, which is less than 0.01 of a percent. That's uh, a CPK 1.33, I think is 99.9963. I think uh, you know, good product, which is you know, where you're going to be. So that's where we're going to be with CP and CPK values. So how does design for manufacture come into this? And, what does it mean? Well, it's quite a simple process, and uh, some would say it's very, very common sense, but um, what's common to one isn't common to somebody else, and it's very easy to um, overlook certain aspects. So with DFMA, Design for Manufacturing Assembly, the goal is to achieve simple solutions in place of complex ones. If you have a complex solution, normally that tends to produce uh, more waste in the form of of uh, time, energy, labor, and potentially defective parts. And the reason for that is, uh, if you look at a cost reduction on, on parts, it's a historic focus is to look at the part cost reduction. And the part cost reduction, the part, sorry, cost, contributes 72% to your overall product cost. So you think that's the highest contribution, so we focused on the part because it's 72%. So we reduce that 72% to reduce the cost. But that approach can lead to simplification of parts. It sounds quite straightforward, and you think that's probably a good thing, and it can be. But the tendency then is once you simplify the parts, uh, it lends to an increase in your part count. Because whereas maybe you have one part before doing uh, many functions, now you have multiple parts to perform the same functions because they're simpler. But having multiple parts can then lead to an increase in potential defects because you have more than one part, you've got more inputs into your system. And those increase in potential defects can lead on to reliability issues and then potential service issues in the field, which of course is not in a position we would want to be in. So breaking down DFMA from design for manufacturing assembly, what it is, so DFA, design for assembly, and DFM, design for manufacture. Well, DFA, design for assembly, is basically reducing product assembly cost. So it's reducing the number of assembly operations and making them easier and simpler to perform. Whereas design for manufacture is reducing the overall part production cost. So it minimizes the complexity of the manufacturing operations and makes use of common features and common datums between your parts to get the output you require. And we use a checklist, the engineers in, um, in our design team use a checklist to go through. 
So as I said, it's very easy to think that's straightforward, common, you know, common sense. But uh, when you're focusing on, on your design and your issue and the outcome, it's sometimes very easy to, to miss certain, certain areas. So we use a checklist that the engineers go through each time to just remind themselves how they considered all of the DFMA principles. And some of those are you know, parts symmetry, uh, don't make parts handed if you can help it, make them symmetrical, uh, make them self-jigging and locating, uh, you know, um, make them uh, so they, don't, they stack easy, don't, they, they, the operators don't have to spend time taking things apart to be able to put them back together again into, into the final assembly and so on and so forth. And it's a recognized study uh, that uh, this principle of DFMEA is, imp improves the, the cost profile a lot more than focusing on the, on the particular cost of the parts, as we said, which is normally about 72%, can be up to 72% of the product cost. Uh, the DFMEA approach is, is the way to go to reduce that labor cost. So how do we deploy DFMEA uh, to an open rack? Well, to be fair, the, uh, the open rack design is, is pretty well conforms to a lot of DFMA principles already. It's quite straightforward. Yeah, four vertical members and a top and bottom base tray. Uh, those vertical members do many functions you know, rather than just being a structure for the frame. They have all the equipment piercings in there for the equipment as well. So there's no additional angles fitted. All the forms and lances in there for cabling are there. So it conforms a lot to the uh, DFMA principles. But how do we you know, remove barriers for scalability? How do we look at this again with fresh eyes? What can we do to improve? So we can look at you know, reducing fixtures and making parts self-locating, which is what we did. So looking through the DF and DFA, uh, Design for Assembly, the outcome was to tag parts together to remove the need for fixtures. And Design for Manufacture, the tags replicate the critical equipment interface points. So you know if they go together, you get the dimension you're looking for, which is the 789.6. A picture on the right there just showing a manual weld process uh, and highlighted there with the sort of the, uh, the fixtures go in to currently to uh, hold the rack apart to the, maintain that critical dimension. So what we've done, we've added tags to um, to the members, it's a quite straightforward process to enable us to get a high repeatability. This is a cross section for the base tray at the front. This is showing the, the front frame member, which will go down and engage into the base tray. And you can see the tags there. So we have the square cut out with the equipment interfaces, we call that datum A. And we have the, the single tag at the bottom, which is in line with that datum A. And that engages into a slot in the base tray to locate your part. A secondary tag helps aid orientation so the part isn't twisted in assembly, but it doesn't um, determine the position. It just aids the orientation. The position is always determined by that single tag, which is in direct line with your datum A. And again, at the rear, cross section of the base tray, the rear member comes down, the tags engage into the base tray, and this is the same for the, the top of the cabinet as well. A datum B, the face equipment stop at the back on the lances. Two tags on uh, this one just to orientate the part and stop it from twist twisting. But one tag in line with datum B, which pins that part in, uh, you know, in location between the front and rear. And those piercings in the, in the base tray there are all on one plane. So though, from that, where that tag is on datum B there and the tag on the front on datum A, all on one plane so that can easily be controlled to piercing dimension of plus or minus 0.15. So as long as those parts engage, you know you're gonna get a good outcome. There's no need for any jigs and fixtures. But how do we know? How can we be sure that the outcome is gonna be good? So we do a tolerance loop analysis to help look at what the failure rate would be and what the outcome, or well, predicted outcome will, will be. So we consider the 789.6 dimension and look at a tolerance loop. What affects those dimensions? Well, to be fair, there's, there's not a lot on here, but you can go through and, and pick up on everything that uh, has an input into that critical dimension and then put it into a spreadsheet to get your output. 
Uh, and the spreadsheet can look at the Six Sigma values, root sum squared, or min max. Now, mostly min max and, and things are generally for information. We don't tend to use min max as a tolerance scheme because uh, it's a very expensive way of um, manufacturing. Uh, it would be used mainly for you know, mission critical systems when you'd use a min max. It's a very cost, very costly approach. So here, just showing spreadsheets, where we're doing our tolerance analysis. We've got the loop there, the dimensions in the top left in the blue, enter the dimensions, uh, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, and you see that the dimension A is zero. This is the tag position on the, on the vertical. So the position of the tag to the interface point of the equipment. And the reason it's, you know, it's zero because it's in the same plane, but you have a tolerance on there, plus or minus 0.15. It's so a manufacturing tolerance, so that has to be accounted for. And then a dimension, 789.6 on the top left there. Again, peers to peers, so uh, plus or minus 0.15 tolerance dimension on there. And further down as well, we have uh, some zeros, uh, a plus or minus tolerance of plus or minus 0.25. Now this is to consider uh, the flatness of the parts, because it's okay engaging the, uh, the verticals into your base tray, into your top tray, into your PS slots, and knowing you've got a good dimension. But you know, what about the rest of the rack? <laughs> the equipment doesn't just fit in the, in the top and the bottom. So you need to make sure you can maintain that dimension across the full height of the rack. And um, you know, not unlike myself, getting a sort of middle age, you know, you tend to kind of, uh, there's a tendency to bow out in the middle of the rack. You can uh, get a bit of increase on your 789.6 dimension. So we need to count that tolerance feature there and uh, you know, put that tolerance in and see what outcomes we get. So the outcome's pretty good. You know, look at the graph, it's really good. Uh, a nice bell curve there, good CP and, and CPK, really nice and tight, well within the limits. And we use these, um, this little side here gives us, gives us our output. You can see here, you click a six, six sigma value here, this would give us a predictive, predicted failure rate, sorry. And you can see the predicted, fail predicted sorry, failure rate, put my teeth back in, is 0%. So we're not getting any, any fallout from production on that, which is you know, a good place, and that's where we want to be. So what's the outcome of that analysis? Well, by basically looking at and approaching the design again and revisiting it through as we say, the lens of, of DFMA, of focusing on it. We've made some simple changes with these tags to help locate everything in place. And that's given us a higher level of repeatability. In fact, we can move away now from the manual welding process and, and bring in a robot welding process because now the parts are a tag position, it's repeatable. Uh, a robot can go in there and weld as previously, uh, we may get float in the top and bottom trays against the vertical members. So where you're welding, your gaps may change slightly. Whereas a manually welding is not an issue because a manual welder would just weld accordingly. But a robot, it has to be precise every time. So uh, you need to make sure your process and the parts going in are controlled to be able to do that. So this is where we are now. Move from manual welding to robot welding, which are currently phasing in to produce our OCP racks. There's a little video here just showing the robots welding. And these were, uh, we didn't buy these new, they were taking off, uh, we had a bit of a refurb, they were taking off another area which we were changing around, so we made use of the robots and brought them in to help, help with uh, the OCP production process. The cabinet just gets uh, assembled onto a sliding table and the parts are snapped together with the tags, slid into the robot cell, press the button, and uh, you get yourself a, an OCP rack out the door ready to go to paint. Okay. So I say it wasn't a deep dive today into uh, DFMA and uh, yeah, CPK values. It was just to give you a brief overview. 
But we will be submitting a white paper around uh, June, July this year, available to, uh, to the community if anybody's interested in more information. Okay. So, thank you.